le gouvernement en place. Parce que c'est le gouvernement qui fait à ce que la, cor la corruption est grandissante. Vu qu'il y a manque d'emploi, beaucoup de jeunes sont en train de divaguer partout à cause du manque d'emploi. Donc c'est ça qui est à la base même de la corruption. Education is the backbone of every economy. With education, we are not just looking at just the formal way of learning. To what extent have we applied this system? About 10 years on, what has become of Cameroon educational system? Are we innovative? But globally, does the educational system of Cameroon meet with that aspiration in terms of meeting our vision 2035? Cameroon has not got it to this level where we said education is not yet at the tertiary level. Media sera encore plus mieux. Nous irons plus loin avec des images plus claires. Nos chaînes My Media Prime, My Movie Africa, French and English, My Music Africa, My Gospel Africa, Real Black 1 and 2 seront améliorés sur MOS 17, fréquence 12333, symbol rate 32000, polarité verticale 17 degrés est. Nous satisfaisons toujours nos consommateurs qui regardent toujours nos chaînes. Vos informations, divertissement et éducation. BT Media Group, Building the Future. Protection of lives and properties has and will always be the number one objective of every government in the world. And Cameroon government is not an exception to these. Whether it is a communist state, whether it is a socialist, or whichever form of governance that is in the world, all will have one thing in common, that is to protect lives and properties. President Bia has always re-echoed that message to Cameroonians whenever he addresses the nation telling us that his number one priority is to protect lives and properties. Same with the non-state armed groups and their different factions, who are stating that they are there to protect lives and properties. But the conflict, which is ongoing in the northwest and southwest region, has come to serve as a litmus test to both parties, as the claim for protection of lives and properties remains skyrocket. Despite this claim, murder, kidnappings, Incessant arrests and among others are plaguing in the northwest and southwest region. We are witnessing how people's hands are being chopped off, heads chopped off, and people celebrate the death of one another under the guise of that we are winning fatly. You will see how people celebrate with the killing of others, tagging them, giving them beautiful names. Their advocates will go on the social media stating that those who were killed were black legs enablers, collaborators, call it whatever name that you want to call it. These are some of the things that we witness in the Northwest and in the Southwest region on a daily basis. We, all, we are all aware that all the parties are, are fellows of different religions and the creators of individual religion, be it Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, their creators stand for one thing, which is that the life of a human being is a secret, that take not the life of a person. And we see that as it is being played on a daily basis, celebrating the fact that they are Christian, they are Muslim, but yet celebrating death in which is against their own religion. The common anglophone, which is in the northwest and southwest region, is aiming for one thing, which is common, in the minds of those who are seeking for peace, and that is, in, that is found in the lyrics of the U.S. anthem that, O oh, say, can you see by the down early light, so the twilight light blinging, and that is what they are talking about, that the Anglophone want to see that the war comes to an end, and the fact that the war is still ravaging on, it is putting the minds across that when shall we see the light of the dawn? This is House of Commons with me, Tamai Javis.
Today's edition, we are having a full house while we await the arrival of Barista Tamfu, uh, who is yet to make his arrival because of traffic. He is caught in traffic. Uh, also, that of Mr. Atem Ebako. I introduce to you my guest, with whom we are going to continue our discussion for today. We are going to look at a topic. The motion for today is a new normal uh, when peace becomes more expensive than war. What happens to protection of lives when peace become more uh, when war uh, peace become more expensive than war? What happens to the protection of human lives? And here in the studio, uh, we have um, who is an um, uh, Mr. Innocent. Mr. Innocent is of the Populous People's Action Party. Mr. Innocent, you're welcome to the program. Thank you, Mr. Jarvis. I'm Nomosi Innocent of the Popular Action Party. And of course, we have Kedia Malenfe, who is of the CDM party. Kedia Malenfe, it's a privilege to have you. Thank you. Uh, greetings to you. Greetings to my co-panelists. And uh, take this opportunity to greet all Cameroonians. It's a pleasure to be here again as we give our own uh, views uh, for the progress of our nation, especially in this trying moment when we are undergoing uh, armed conflict in the northwest and the southwest region. I believe my view will go a long way to ensure that uh, appeasement comes to the heart of all those involved so that we can meet real peace again. Also, we have Ms. Angalim who is joining us via Skype. Ms. Angalim, it's a privilege to have you. Um, we are having difficulties to connect with Ms. Angalim, and I hope that. Uh, in a couple of minutes or so, we shall get connected back with Ms. Angalim, who is uh, joining us via Skype from the United States of America. Uh, while we kickstart this edition of the program, I begin with you, Mr. Uh, Kedia Malinfe. We are looking at the topic, a new normal, when peace has become more expensive than war, what ha then happens uh, becomes of the protection of human lives. We've seen the, when the crisis started in 2016, we had a different perspective from 2017 when they moved to a full-blown armed conflict. A different perspective came into place, and we are seeing both parties, the belligerent, attacking each other to say that those who are being killed are either enablers, blacklegs, um, you know, collaborators with the state armed groups or the non-state armed groups. Uh, what is it uh, so difficult? Why is it so difficult for us to have a clear-cut dichotomy of peace in this conflict? Uh, you see, when uh, the First World War started, you realize that all countries were excited. You see France, they came out, they sang the masses, and they went into the street. But uh, when the war went on, the consequences, all the world regretted why uh, they went into uh, this uh, war in the first place. Uh, same case with uh, the, uh, in the southwest and in the northwest region. When all this started, uh, people thought that it was all about uh, marginalization of the English-speaking people. Uh, the cases of the lawyers and the cases of uh, the um, teachers. But however, when times went on and uh, all these things happened, uh, now we are at war. And uh, to be able to stop this, we need uh, to come together, share responsibility. And as we go ahead with the program, I will give out clearly the part that uh, the government needs to play. I will give out the part of those in the diaspora about uh, compromising, and especially those in the ground in the northwest and southwest uh, region, where they themselves, they have the powers more than the government and more than those in the diaspora to bring peace if uh, they want to. So as time goes up, I will explain that more. Okay, we're just joined by Mr. Atem Ebako. Uh, Mr. Atem Ebako, you're welcome to the program. A privilege to have you. Thank you very much, all the viewers of uh, the House of uh, Commons. Special greetings and to the panelists who are here this afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll continue with you before coming to Mr. Innocent. Uh, Mr. Atem Ebako, we are now looking at um, the conflict from the humanitarian and financial perspective. Um, many, you are a Pan-Africanist, and we believe that Pan-Africanists are people who look at uh, uh, things to form a, 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 a perspective that will be uh, less costly and look at it from the natural order that we must go for peace than war. Uh, but in the conflict of North and Southwest region, we are seeing that both parties are showing us that peace is more expensive than fighting the war. 
Well, you, the, the, the thing about uh, the conflicts in Cameroon, especially the one in the two English-speaking uh, regions of this country and many other conflicts which we are wit witnessing currently in Africa, the genealogies and the, and the how will I put it, the, the circumstances which surround them are almost similar. And one of the first things that the Cameroonians or the English-speaking Cameroonians in those two regions will need to understand is why the conflict in the first place and why is it the way it is right now. You see, you know, you know, in, in order to, to diagnose the situation, we need to be able to look beyond the walls of just those two regions and the conflict which is going on on ground and the, the suffering which it has brought upon the lives and properties and destinies of people from those two regions and the nation as a whole. If you don't look at it from that uh, picture out of the box of just the two regions, we will not be able to understand what is going through in the, I mean, uh, in terms of the crisis. And we have to also understand that when we are looking at it from that bigger picture, you come to realize that the problems in Cameroon does not limit only in those two regions. The, 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 there is a problem in Cameroon as a whole. And as a matter of fact, the majority of Cameroonians, almost close to 80 to 85 percent of Cameroonians, are in that same kind of problem, whether they be English speaking or they be French speaking. So we must understand here that if we do not look at it from that perspective, we will not be able to come out with practical solutions on a way forward in solving this problem. And that's why you realize that this conflict has been going on for a very long time of people in the same nation. I mean, Cameroonians fighting Cameroonians. It's hard to understand how Cameroonians are fighting themselves when yet the multinationals are here and they are not facing the challenges which Cameroonians are facing. And yet the Chinese are here and not facing what the Cameroonians are facing. And yet the Americans are here and not facing what the Cameroonians are facing. And yet the Russians are here, the United Kingdom, I mean the West is here and not facing what the Cameroonians are facing. How do you explain those things, that we are in a conflict in a country where its population lives in abject po poverty, crisis, I mean civil conflict, and yet all of these parties I have mentioned are not suffering what Cameroonians are suffering. This is just to tell you that the conflict in those two regions goes beyond the understanding of Cameroonians, and we must understand that as long as two locals are fighting, it makes the meat become very easy for the voucher. And until Cameroonians understand that this has always been the strategy, and no one will seek for their interest except themselves decide to come together and understand that Cameroon is for Cameroonians and only Cameroonians can build Cameroon. It is not here whereby Cameroonians are protecting the interest of someone, of another person, a ghost which has no blood relationship, which has no biological links to Cameroonians at the expense of the blood and destiny and properties of Cameroonians to support the prizes of those who are above and the prizes of those who are not Cameroonians. And this goes on both sides, uh, Mr. Jarvis, and anti Cameroonians come to this reality that they are fighting the wrong battle and the people which they should be fighting, which they do not seem to see, are the ones that they need to go beyond this picture. We are talking today in Cameroon, you go to Mozambique, it is the same situation. You go to Sudan, it is the same situation. You go to Ethiopia, it is the same situation. You go to Gabon is the same situation. You go to Ivory Coast is the same situation. You go to Chad, Central Africa is the same situation. So this has been the current and the same situation is plaguing in Ethiopia and in, in it, it, exactly what I'm trying to say. So this you turn to neighboring Nigeria, it is the same thing. This is just to tell you that Cameroonians and Africans need to come to this point and understand how you explain the fact to me, Javis, where Cameroonians and Africans travel abroad and their presence is seen physically, the mass migration of Cameroonians, the mass migrations of Africans traveling abroad until now it is a concern in the West why Africans are traveling too much because of civil conflicts in their country. But explain to me, Mr. Javis, how is it possible that they are here in their governments, they travel with their governments, they travel with their multinational companies. We do not see them physically, but we feel the effect.
Okay. And it is on the basis of these effects that we are having all of this insecurity, all of this uh, conflict and struggle and fighting one another okay. because we do not seem to see them. We have structures which are in place which denies its own people. Yeah. Um, uh, before coming to you, Mr. Innocent, let me see if our Skype, uh, if the person from Skype is around because I want him to speak. Then you queue in from where he will end. Um, Zangalim, are you there? Uh, Mr. Zangalim, are you there? Are you seeing us? Yes, uh, thank you for having me on the program today, Jarvis. Oh, it's a privilege to have you. Um, again, I want to come to, uh, to come to you. I uh, understand that uh, today is the 4th of July. You guys are Hi, kind Jarvis. of... Yes, I'm getting you. I'm getting you. Right on. I can check now. Yes, I'm saying that... Um, yes, can... yes, today is the 4th of July. I know it's, it should be a public holiday from where, where you are. Um, want us to get into perspective. Why is it so difficult for us to have peace in this conflict uh, when both sides seemingly are taking uh, showing us that war is less expensive than peace yeah Jarvis, you know um it's always very difficult to end a war after we start it and the reason is because before we start the war both parties always think they are going to override um the other party within no time uh, when this conflict just started, remember very well, some people in government said it was going to be about two weeks and uh, all the Ambazonian fighters were going to be crushed. And some on the Ambazonian side said independence is there the very next day. That is how conflict starts, through um, exaggerated language, through our, our estimation of resources. And at the end of the day, people find themselves in a conflict that they cannot resolve with, within time. And because uh, both parties to, to, to a conflict always think they have all the means to crush the other party the next day, they, are, they, they become filled with ego and it's difficult for them to sit down and talk. So the reason for which you are seeing what is happening in, in the war between the Amazonians and the government today is not strange. It happens everywhere. And it's important that we come back, we come to the realization that war is not a walk in the park and, you know at the dialogue for at the at the coalition for dialogue and negotiation we are working hard to ensure that this conflict is seen as something that can be solved today or tomorrow the reason is people die every day and we cannot keep on propagating war, blaming one side or blaming the other side in a situation where we need to bring people down to sit and talk. And as we go ahead with the conflict, there is something that everyone needs to come back come back to base. Had government decided in 2016 to honestly sit down and talk with the leaders of the consortium, we shouldn't have been where we are today. Had government decided since 1961 to respect the will of the people of the southern Cameroons, we shouldn't have been where we are today. So it comes back to talk about governance. While we, while we can blame both sides to the conflict, let us remember that one side has a more important role to play in resolving this conflict, and that is the government. The government has the resources. The government has international obligations, the government has uh, domestic obligations, all of these are grounded in law. And government needs to show the goodwill to sit down and talk with the people. May he so rest in peace, uh, his eminence, Christian Cardinal Tumi, he wanted to bring uh, citizens of the southern Cameroons to sit down, carve a way forward, have their agreements so that they can table this as one, as one voice but the government refused that from happening now when we look at what is happening government still says it is difficult they don't know whom they can talk to which i don't think it is very accurate it is not even accurate because they know all those leaders they have been pinpointing they want this leader they want this leader they want this leader they, the the host countries should send them back and if if it continues this way then we are running we are running to a situation where we will fight the war for, for the next 30 years, next 40 years, next 50 years. Because the Amazonians are using uh, an asymmetrical warfare system where we don't see them. 
they come to strike and move away. If you count the number of people who have been exhibited in the streets as Ambazonian fighters, uh, I think that is way more, way more than the number of Ambazonian fighters. But the war is still raging. Therefore, government needs to take its responsibility. People who talk to government need to take their responsibility. And everyone needs to take their responsibility to bring this war, this war to an end as soon as possible. Mr. Galim, just a brief, a brief follow-up um, before coming to the studio. Uh, you talked about the fact that the government needs to take its responsibility. But the Cameroon government will argue that they convened the uh, first was we, they had an interministerial ad hoc committee that was in Bamenda and in Yaoundé for the teachers in Bamenda, for the lawyers in Yaoundé. And they will argue that uh, as fallout they, cre they created the bilingualism and multiculturalism commission. And the government will still say that te uh, teachers were deleted deployed to their region of origin, I think 1,000 teachers, and there, were, there was a recruitment of 1,000 bilingual science teachers uh, to top up the game, and the government will still argue that they uh, created a grand, they call for a grand measure national dialogue, which some of the leaders were called into place, um, they did not attend the, 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 the invitation, and that there is a reconstruction committee that is ongoing to reconstruct Northwest and Southwest region, and that there is also the disarmament demobilization center, which is being created as part of the strategy from the major national dialogue above all the government who argue that um, they are doing enough to ensure that schools resume effectively are these not measures that the government can tell us that they have been able to take in order to mitigate this conflict why the non state and group on their own on their own side of the coin seemingly are bent on either independent or nothing else If you're talking to me that I could not hear the question, Jarvis. I, 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 I will take that briefly. I'm saying that the government will say, argue that they have created the disarmament commission, uh, they have reintegrated teachers, they have created a major national, the call for the major national dialogue uh, that uh, gave solutions and special status is in full force. Yes, Jarvis, you know, um, when government made all these proposals, at the very beginning, told them, Teachers and lawyers told them these are insufficient. Teachers and lawyers wanted an honest conversation. They wanted to sit around the table and talk and craft uh, solutions together. But government went ahead and did what, what they did. And if these could be solutions, then the conflict must have ended or the conflict must have been mitigated or we should have been seeing signs of the conflict ending. But we see the conflict rather escalating. Uh, from the very beginning, these Ambazonians were on the field with uh, game guns and sometimes with uh, catapults, but now we see improvised explosive devices, which means the conflict keeps on aggravating by the day. It's therefore important that government relooks at what it has done and see that it is not sufficient, because all those steps you have enumerated have not resolved or have not mitigated the conflict in any way. These were meant to mitigate the conflict in some way. But rather, what I see is that government is trying to pull out Ambazonians to get tired, to let the community get tired, and when the community turns against Ambazonians, or when the community feels that the conflict has become so heavy a burden for them to bear, they will fight against Ambazonians and then the conflict will end. But we are not seeing that. We are not seeing that. Okay. We, we can cite the number of uh, Ambazonian fighters who have been taken to, to the GDR centers. We can cite the number of uh, people who have, been, who have gone to the Supreme Court, uh, to the audit bench of, sorry, to ENAM, in, uh, the Anglophone bench. But we finally realize that the conflict is not ending. The conflict keeps pushing forward. Therefore, there is a problem somewhere. And this problem is the lack of participatory governance. You know, when you make decisions about people without involving them then it would one day come to this. In okay. 1961, the decision was made by the people. In 1972, it was made without the people and only given to the people to consume. And since then, up to today, the, the decisions have been made by Yaoundé and given to the people to consume. Okay. This is a fundamental reason for which all those uh, steps and strategies you have cited are not working and have not worked. And I'm afraid they're not going to work. Mr. At no. the coalition for okay. dialogue and negotiation, uh, we'll come back to you. Thank you. We are looking forward to talking to people, talking to government, talking to Ambazonian fighters to realize that it is necessary to sit down and talk. 
Thank yes, you. Janice. Thank you. We'll be coming back to you. Be on standby. Mr. Innocent of the Populist Action Party. Uh, we are looking at this war from a humanitarian and a financial perspective. The money being championed by the non-state armed groups would have been championed for a lot of activities within the Northwest and Southwest region. If you look at the amount that has been generated to fund the war, this amount could have created lots of industries, a lot of educational facilities, a lot of economic uh, ventures in the Northwest and Southwest region that would have benefited the people of this region than moving into war. Mr. Javis, we talk about peace. peace. There can be no development in a war zone. Now, everyone has been singing the song of peace. What is peace in the first place? Peace is the absence of justice and truth. Where justice and truth is not present, their world is present. Now, talking about the fund that has been generated by the non-armed groups and the state to put to an end this crisis is too much. Nine billion was used to fund the major national dialogue that resulted to nothing. Looking keenly, we see that this crisis have come to a complicated state, as I will always say, and both parties are very much interested in feeding themselves fat, making themselves from the crisis. Because Looking keenly on the both sides, we see that they are not there for the interests of the people. They are there first for themselves. Because if the interests of the people was their number one priority, the protection of property and lives would have been the first agenda on their scale of preference. But since it has gone beyond that, since it is now an issue of interest on both sides, that's why the war keeps escalating. They will generate money for the world, but they will not generate money to develop the country. On the side of the government, the government has the upper hand, as my co-panelist said, to resolve this crisis because international communities, political parties, and other groups is calling on the government who has the legitimate power over this territory to organize a sincere dialogue that will put an end to this crisis. But yet, every day we keep on getting solutions that are cosmetic. I call them cosmetic because you have mentioned a series of solutions, a series of proposals put in place by the government to end this crisis, but yet we have not arrived at any solution. So we are still calling on the government who has the upper hand to end this crisis to organize an all sincere dialogue how can you um you have the popular action party but when you say the major national dialogue uh produce nothing we have the special status we have the regional assembly we the head of state appointed uh independent conciliators and uh, we also talked about the dzr that was the, the, there's a fallout of the major national dialogue are you for sure saying that all these structures are, are nothing which we see them in being implemented mr javis you are a son of somebody if you go to your father and ask for bread and he gives you a cake instead and say bread is not good for you what will be your reaction the people did not ask for a special status the people asked for something else and they were given a special status there is a sense in which the, 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 the giver was saying that you are not qualified to ask for what you are asking for you are not privileged to ask for what to enjoy what you are asking for. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Barista Tanfu, we've just been joined by Barista Tanfu. Happy Sunday and a privilege to have you. Thank you, Mr. Javis. Good afternoon to my co panelists. Good afternoon to all those who are viewing this program. And also, good afternoon to all uh, the political prisoners, especially the Anglophone detainees who are in the prisons of Cameroon. I extend my greetings to them. But we are looking at the new normal when uh, peace becomes more expensive than war. What then becomes to protection of human lives? The civils, the non state armed groups would claim that they are fighting to protect lives and properties. That's why they, they caption it uh, self-determination defense. And the state armed groups would say they are protecting the lives and properties. But ironically, we see that 
the activities of both sides keep plunging the common man into the early graves because whether we like it or not there are a couple of people who are being who are being killed not by the guns or not by the bullet but by diseases in the bushes but poverty and uh, lack of basic amenities uh, is it not proper that both sides should now start looking at which resolve this conflict yes all what you just highlighted are the consequences of war the, pe the people who thought that uh, by going through the military way or instituting violence using the arms was the best uh, they themselves are seeing the confusion in which they have uh, plunged parties as we know we only know when a war will start we don't know when it's going to end and the consequences that we are facing today are really devastating making it difficult to know exactly at which state we are into this uh, armed conflict but it's regrettable because uh, we still believe that uh, there is somebody somewhere who has an upper hand over the other party and that part and that person is playing a very bad role the person is not doing any efforts to put an end to this conflict and uh, uh, we have we see the effect that the more the war continues to 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 stay we see that the, the civilian populations are suffering people are suffering sincerely if you ha if you have the opportunity to visit refugee camps you see how people are suffering people who are arrested for no good reasons and they are in the prisons for nothing and uh, you have parties who none of them because no none of the parties is willing to to come to the table but I will not want to be labor on the point because we know that there is among these two persons who are fighting there is somebody who has that possibility to really bring an end to this war and even the anglophone elites who are not making any effort just imagine a situation in time where for example all those elites who are in the Yaoundé regime if they could come out with a one memo those who are in parliament, those who are in the military, those who are in the uh, public service, those who are in government offices, if they could come out as one man and put a strong memo to the, to the, to the government in place that we have been fighting for so long now and uh, time has come for us to live peace. I think those are some of the actions that will really push the, the, the government to come to peace because we now see that uh, peace is peace is now even more expensive than the war itself because uh, we find we find people instead agitating the war people are happily making things to but instead by Satanfu, just an, in, 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 uh, I want you to react on this you made an al allusion that um, you know uh, both parties especially the government have uh, the elite of the government, that's the Anglophone elite, Anglophone have not elite. been able to table a strong motion. But this elite will tell you that they have done meet the people's store, especially during the 2017, where we saw elite like Young Philomon, the then Prime Minister at the time, he went to Northwest Region. We had others in the Southwest Region, were in the Southwest Region, who came to the Southwest Region, they were talking to the people. And equally, during the period of the major national dialogue consultations, uh, we had consultations that were, you know, went around with the people. Uh, with the people but are these not you know signs to show that the elites too did their best maybe their hands are tied no before this conference before this conflict sparked we discovered that there was lack of confidence in the representations the population was no more having that confidence on those elites that were representing them so that is why when these elites were going to the field to like try to talk to them the feedback was not being felt in your own day so there is this uh, disproportionate representation people the people who are the even those who are there now are actually not representing the people because we know how elections were organized in this country we know that those those regions did not take actively take part but i still want just to give a doubt that if those who are there even though they don't really represent the people if really they were of good fit they could come out very clear and make a good memo to to, to, to the government that we have been fighting for so long now and that it is high time for peace even though those people who are there actually do not represent but hey, your, your party elite. you are an elite yes i am an rc has elite yes. uh, fire elvis is an elite you are an elite uh Semutaga is an elite we have not seen this yes. communicator from we, this elite we, we they don't give us the possibility for example we have tabled thousands of memorandum solutions to the government but which have they applied have they applied we have seen NG, we have seen organizations coming to to, to come on on series
Okay. They came and they gave proposals. Still, yet the government goes its own way. So it's not like we are not working. We Which, are... in effect, you are saying that still, even if they are on early table, they are motion. No, I don't. think if this time around, all of us come out as one man, not that everybody is going at its own time. We should come out as one man and then all of us agree unanimously not that you be you you take the forefront others will stay behind and instead treat you as okay. uh, uh, so, that, so we need to agree and that is why i i still cried uh, late uh, kajina to me because he had that vision he thought that no uh, when he's looking at the anglophone elite it's as if all of them are not in agreement that it was high time for example to call them back home sit with them and then see who actually represents the anglophone elite and the, the government in its own uh, uh, ways of be dividing and rule had to do everything possible so that uh, such a conference should not hold and okay. that is why today we don't even know who are those elites representing or who are those people who can really talk for the anglophones today and that's uh, that's where we are that's where we find ourselves today and uh, still yet it is not nothing is it's not yet lost because uh, mr bia who is on power still has that possibility to put an end you know he knows the people that he can bring okay. to the table and talk with them mr atem ibako um you've listened to what paris tatanfu just articulated it, it therefore means that we have we have elites of different categories we have the cpj elite room uh, uh the, the 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 those are elite to him who are, are yet to write officially to the government to say that this conflict needs to come to an end. Um, you, as a Pan-Africanist, what can you make of the confusion between the different elites and coming together to say that this war should come to an end as far as the North State Angles themselves too, fighting on the other side that the war should continue, but they too are Cameroonians. Well, uh, Javis, you see, to me, the way I've understood this conflict is just in as much as any other conflicts we have been seeing in Africa. The one in Cameroon is not a special case. Like I was saying in Mozambique, we just, we, I mean, we are having almost more than 3,000 lives that have been lost. That's just about 2017 that that conflict started in that country. We have had millions of uh, 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 people from that country who have migrated to other places as refugees. So what is happening in Cameroon, we have to understand that it is in the interest on both sides and it's not in the interest of the common man. And why it is like that is because the interest, the, the interest which each party is safeguarding is not the interest in which he was supposed to, he, he is called to represent. And uh, when we talk on looking at the elites, I will not want us to put the blame on the elites or the chiefs or the leaders because everybody has a share and a role of responsibility to play in a society. And anyone who blames other without taking a share of a blame, then that means the person has not understood what really is a, is a, I mean, what really is the drive force of the conflict. You see, when you talk about a system which we understand that to start with as a basic default foundation, the, 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 the system or the government did not derive from the doors of the masses. That simply means that the government was, did not pass through the doors of the masses in terms of being democratically elected by the majority of the people of this country. That simply means that the government is not accountable to the people because it's not the people that put the government there. It's like I gave an example from the 60s to the 61 to the 19, uh, 1984. None of these leaders were democratically elected. They were being appointed and not by the Cameroonians. They were being appointed by another government so we have to understand the kind of government we have today in cameroon so when we are complaining about elites who have gone in there to bring change in their society it doesn't matter whether they were elected or they were appointed what matters is what they are able to do or what they want to do and what they strive to do we heard about what the uh, senator mbela moki was saying he's an elite as well in that party but you realize that his hands are tied and that's the setup and his hands are not only tied as an elite in the cpdm but even the hands of our government administrators their hands are tied we have to come to this daunting reality that we have a system and structures that were put in place which denies the cameroonians their own future in yeah, their how, own how, how how tight are their hands when it comes to 
siphoning of state funds like COVID funds and when it comes to funds allocated for buildings, construction of roads and uh, providing portable water to the people, uh, uh, is it still tight? That's a very good uh, question. You are here talking about an individual. And where we are talking here about a nation, the interests of the people of the nation, you are referring to an individual. That's different. When a man is called to represent a people and the man is given very limited resources, the best of the things the man will do is to take care of himself because he knows that what he has is insufficient to take care of the rest of the people. We are talking here about 26 million Cameroonians. We are not talking about Mr. Bia. We are not talking about uh, the Prime Minister or the, the I mean, Bela Moki. We are talking about the Cameroonians. It is the Cameroonians who are going through this process and it's the very reason why we are here discussing about their, their, their untold sufferings. So we have to understand and that these are the structures which I'm trying to describe, that these structures have been put in place whereby it is, how will I call it, it comes into uh, functionalities on how Cameroon is going to work. Okay. And it is these structures now that deprives the Cameroonians to get the demands of the Cameroonians and the, I mean, the, the organization, the constitution, the policies which are in place do not reflect the demands of the Cameroonians and that's why we are complaining because we realize that foul play is done at every level. So here we find an interest on both sides whereby the government has an interest on the war, like I gave an statistics last time, that we are dealing here with 20,000 military uh, 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 armed forces down there in the northwest and southwest, sent by the government, 20,000. Fighting who? 2,000 armed separatist fighters. If you put that ratio on the table, it means there is no war here, but there is an existing conflict going on on ground that the physical eyes can see and you can feel. But when you look at that statistic, it tells you that this war should not even exist in the place in the first place because you are dealing here with 20,000 against 2,000. It means that you should not even draw for one hour. So if it's going on, it simply means that there is a hidden agenda behind and this is what Cameroonians do not understand. And that's why I'm saying that you have to understand what Cameroon is and know the vision was that was set up in Cameroon in the first place in the 60s. Okay. It was not set up for the Cameroonians to possess Cameroon and to live a life in their own country. And that's why I said that that is a, one of the main genealogies why we still pay colonial tax yes. to France because we are considered to be occupying a land which belongs to them. So the, st the structure which is here has to be removed. And in order for it to be removed, it will take the Cameroonians themselves to come to this reality and build a united front and flush out this system and then build a government that will reflect the people. Kedia Malafe, uh, you just listened to uh, what um, uh, Mr. Atem Ebaku said. He talked about the fact that um, you know, we have about 20,000 soldiers fighting 2,000 armed conflict, armed men, which by default, the ratio, it shows that there is no war. But how do you explain the fact that the government, your party chairman, uh, is stating that um, the, the, the military is there to protect lives and properties, uh, and at the same time, lives and properties are still being uh, Lives have been taken away, properties have been destroyed. Just of recent, we had the killing of a teacher in Kumba who was killed by unarmed or an unidentified armed men. In this regard, can we still boast that we are the, the, the both sides are there to protect lives and properties? Um, as he earlier said, 20,000 against 2,000, for instance. That's why you see the United Nations, Commonwealth, Francophonie, all these international organizations they still remain with the terminology armed conflict and not war. There is a difference between an armed conflict and war. They have their various definitions. What well, definitions okay. so that we can now, get it now, uh, war, war here talks, uh, describe a violent fight between two arms with the use of jet and sophisticated weapons, like sophisticated, that describe a war. But here we are just in an armed conflict where we see people with stick, then guns, maybe some few Karashnikov and the rest, which has not really gone to the other extent. So armed conflict and war are totally different. All right, uh, it, is, it, it is very sad when uh, we see that the government have done nothing. 
At times, I even feel that some of us English-speaking people, we are scared to even ask that what have the Amber fighters done to, 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 to compromise and bring peace. Nobody is talking about that. I understand that the government is illegal, the government is legit legitimate, the government has the power to bring peace. But when we say the government have done nothing, I ask myself question, if we have consciences or we are just saying this so that people can applaud for us, if we say the government have done nothing, do we know the definition of nothing? Well, yeah, let me just list some of the things that the government have done. They have employed bilingual teachers. When this crisis started, that we are here shouting about night dialogue, dialogue. We should not forget that the present Prime Minister, the uh, Minister of Commonwealth, was sent to South Africa to dialogue with those in the diaspora. Some were sent in Europe, some were sent in America and Canada to dialogue with them. Dialogue started first with those in the diaspora and not those back at home. Are we aware now that what we are talking about uh, uh, self-administration uh, uh, autonomy? Are we aware that 80% of uh, 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 deals in the Northwest are people from our regions? Are we aware that 80% of senior divisional officers back there at home are from our regions? They may take someone from the Southwest and send in the Northwest, but the majority are English-speaking people. We should do our findings. We will see that. Are we aware that there is a section now when we complain about this issue of common law and the rest? Are we aware that for the past three years when this conflict started, 30 court register and 50 magistrate of the English expression has been uh, admitted into a NAM to be able to solve this problem? I cannot even count many of them that have done. Are, are we aware? Yes. Are we aware that <laughs> schools have been destroyed? My question to you, Mr. Kija, is... The government says they're protecting lives and properties. Yet we have two thousand military, two twenty thousand military, as Mr. Atem Ebaku said, sure. and we have only two thousand state armed groups, non state armed groups in the northern South region. Yet we still have destruction of lives and properties still region. Or you say it's a conflict, uh, which by your ideology means that this conflict, looking at the mathematics, twenty thousand of two thousand, there should not be any conflict. And why do we still have uh, possibilities where we see teachers like the teacher in Korea? Right. I'll here? go. I'll go. I'll go to detail now because Can I thought say, I thought yes, I already answered your question, but I'll go into detail now. Yes. All right. Now, the military that has been sent by President Pogba in the Northwest and Southwest region is to protect people, persons, and their property. The Ambazonia fighters that have picked up arms are still Cameroonians. The military has obligations to protect these Ambazonia with guns. That's why they arrest them. If it happens that a military kill at Ambazonia is based on self-defense, because even a, min a, a military man has a right to self-defense. I can be coming to protect you and you want to kill me. I have the right to protect myself. So that's why they so, conflict is So young. we should be aware that the military is out there to protect the people and their property. However, the good job they have done is that some have dropped their arms, and they're in the DRC center. Some are still there resisting, using the guerrilla warfare where they come in, they attack, and they go back. And that's why it is still persisting. And that's why then I went into explanation now to explain to the people that this is what the government has. It is, the crisis is persisting, yes. They do a guerrilla warfare, they come, they attack, they go. That's why it's still there. But it is still persisting. Okay. Now we are analyzing why is it still persisting. Yeah. That is why I have given out all the points of what the government have done to bring peace. Schools have been burned. The government has cried that education is the fundamental human right of the child of children. Schools are being constructed. Their children are going back to school. Medical centers, the one in Kumba and the rest that were burned, it is being constructed so that people can have back their life. But the question now I ask is, what has the separatist fighters done, those in the diaspora and back home, to compromise peace? There is nothing. So they have not shifted a bit from the They position, have not. But the government has shifted. The I'm government has. The government has. We have seen what they have done. I've just named some of them okay. here. But the question is, what have these guys done to compromise? And that's the uh, essence of peace. Okay. When it comes to peace, you need to compromise to bring peace. The government has done it part. But these guys have done nothing. I've listed all of them here. I will be very proud. If one person here can be honest to name one thing that the separatist guys have done, one person here yeah, defending the, okay. uh, the Amazonians <laughs> or what? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Angadi. Are you there with us?
I am here with you, Jarvis. Okay, um, you've listened to Kedja. Kedja is bringing a new narrative that it is not a war, it is an armed conflict, that the soldiers are there to protect lives and properties, including the non-state armed groups, that they are Cameroonians and the soldiers are supposed to protect them at that on occasions that the soldiers are threatened by the state and the non-state armed groups, then they have the right to take them out. You as a human rights advocate, I want to get a perspective into that. Yes, Jarvis, you know, it, sometimes listening to um, civilian militants could be irritating to the core, but uh, for the sake of uh, public decorum and for the sake of education, we need to really listen to them and try to educate our people on the fundamentals of life. Um, Mr. Keja has made a lot of allegations there. Uh, the only the only thing he said, which I agree with, is that soldiers, like every other like every other human being, have a right to self to self defense. But that said, the fact that soldiers have a right to self defense does not mean that soldiers should go around burning villages, killing people in masses, and coming out and saying they have done nothing wrong through the CPD militants. It is very, very improper, and it disrespects the memory of those who have been killed uselessly throughout this war. It disrespects the pain of all those who are in refugee camps. It disrespects the pain of all those who are internally displaced, and it, dis and it disrespects the pain of those who see these uh, gruesome images every day. While I agree that uh, these violations occur on both sides, we also need to be very careful the way we talk out there. There is war is propagated by language. In 2016, had people not come out, especially people of the CPDM, had they not come out to stand up loud and shout and shout loud that there is nothing anybody can do, we shouldn't have been where we are. When the lawyers and the teachers came out in 2016 and said, enough is enough, we want to sit down and talk about these issues, is the same people like Mr. Keja who said government will not negotiate with terrorists. In 2016, they referred to Agbobala, uh, Wilfred Tassam, Justice Aya Paul as terrorists. Who we were federalists today, at the time. The terrorists, the people they call terrorists today are carrying arms. In 2016, the people they called terrorists did not carry arms. And the terrorist narrative has not won any, 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 um, in this upon out of Cameroon or in fact out of CPDM circles. And it's very important to know that terrorism is a crime that is fought internationally. Once a country identifies terrorist organizations within their circles, the whole world comes in immediately to join them to fight those terrorists. If the whole world has not come in today to join Cameroon to fight what they call terrorists in, in the southern Cameroons, it means there is a problem and these people are definitely not terrorists. So it is time for, for the CPDM to sit down and take an honest look. I know in the innermost part of me that they know that all of these things they have done so far are not working and are not going to work. The reason is simple. This conflict did not start in 2016. This conflict started way back at least at least in 1962 when the forebears when when the when the four, the founding fathers started complaining of the relationship between the southern Cameroons and West Cameroon because agreements were not respected, and like I said in my previous intervention, the best solution to this problem is sitting down and talking. Dialogue resolves everything. Participate, participatory governance resolves everything. Uh, the Swiss have said they want to talk. They want to help the belligerents to talk. The government has refused. Some Amazonian groups are already there in Switzerland waiting for the government to come and talk. So, you know, peace has no price. Justice has no price. But war has a price, which is cost, and that is human life, human property. People are destroyed for four years, five years running. People cannot live in the territory. People cannot. I, I heard I just Kedja said people are not going to school. Why are people not going to school? People are not going to school because at the very beginning of this of this conflict, the Ambazonians decided to use the, the, the school strategy as a civil at that time was seven Ambazonians, it was at the consortium. They used it as a civil disobedience strategy to force government to make amends, which government refused to make. And then it went out of government's control and now we're talking about war. And when we talk about education being a fundamental right, 
I, 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 I always I always hesitate taking this conversation because mm -hmm. fundamental rights depend on fundamental rights. The right to life is more fundamental than the right to education. The simple reason is because a corpse cannot claim the right to education. Because once somebody's child goes out there and is killed, that child will never, ever have the education again. The teacher who was put in Kumba yesterday, will he ever will he ever exercise his right to education again to te by teaching those children? The answer is no. So the fundamental thing we need to be looking at is peace. The fundamental thing we need to look at is justice. Okay. The fundamental thing we need to look at is how to end this okay. war. Because sitting down and talking is very, very important. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We're coming back to you, Mr. Innocent. Uh, maybe you want to react to Kedia. Um, I want to react to Kedia directly. Now, when he, the first thing is he asks, can anybody here cite what the Ambazonians has done for the good of the people? It is unacceptable here because no one is here to represent them. Secondly, looking at the foundation of this problem, Looking at the foundation of this problem, we understand that Cameroonians are divided into three classes. Now, you have the social class and the political class, you have the middle class, and you have the common man. Now, the social class and the political class are made up of top-ranking officials of the government. Now, the middle class are made up of businessmen, and the common class are made up of people, commoners. So, the, the, the structure of administration has been fixed in such a way that the people of the social class project themselves to be worshipped by the people of the normal class. So, the way they think, the way they talk, it is different from the way the people from the normal class talk. That's why in a panel like this, you will see people with different ideologies and mentality because the Cameroonian society has not permitted everyone to be live in a equal. Some people believe that they are more Cameroonian than others. But in 1990 when they are launched, Mr. President, they are launched freedom of mass communication and freedom of expression. It means that every Cameroonian has the right to exercise, uh, you know, the, the right freedom of association, freedom of, of, of speech and democracy. Yeah, we are not talking about freedom of word, freedom of speech, or freedom of expression. When this crisis started, they were our same Anglophone brothers who stood on media and denied the existence of an Anglophone problem. But there were evidences everywhere that there was a problem. Now, this is the class issue I'm talking about. People of that class, they think the people of the lower class do not reason like them. So at times, the way they talk, they talk without considering the people of that class. So the rule, our rule as politicians, political parties, and civil society organization is to empower the people down there so that they should be aware that power belongs to them. They should be aware that the military man terrorizing them, it is their employee is being paid from their tax money. The deal who is hatch on them, it is their servant so that these people should be accountable to Cameroonians because the problem we face in Cameroon is lack of accountability. And the administrators we have, they know, they owe us no accountability. And that is why we are where we are today. Okay, um, Bryce Tanfu, you listened to what Kedia said. And um, before you, you react, I want to ask you my question based on the protection of lives and properties. We keep hearing the songs that the state armed groups are stating we are here to protect lives and properties. Atem Ebako, Mr. Atem Ebako has given a clear uh, picture that we have 20,000 military as opposed to 2,000 state armed groups, based on what Mr. Atem Ebako stated. That, but when we go to the numerical formula, you see that there is no conflict. There's no war based on the you know, amount of foot soldiers on the ground and the logistics. And that how do we explain the fact that even with the 20,000 uh, as opposed to the 2,000, we still have the destruction of uh, properties, we still have killings ongoing in the northern and southwest region, and your political party, the CRM, may have proposed 
uh, I've proposed other ways in which this conflict can be resolved. Is there any other thing that um, your party can do to, to ensure that these lives and properties are well protected, such that Cameroonians can't live as they used to live before? Maybe it can be proposed to the government. Yes. Uh, you know, Cameroon has a constitution, and uh, the head of state is the guarantor of that constitution. The head of state has the responsibility to protect lives and properties of Cameroonians. So if uh, we are not, if we live in Cameroon and we are not sure that uh, our lives and property will be protected by the head of state, meaning that there is a problem, meaning that that head of state is either failing in his duties. And that is the reason why you see how the Cameroon Renaissance movement has been advocating that uh, we, I think there is need for time to change because uh, the ruling class today is obsolete, short of ideas, is not more able to protect lives and properties of Cameroonians. And uh, uh, the, the, the ruling class today is not able to give a listening ear to the problems of Cameroonians. We have been singing this song for quite some time now that uh, if we really want a lasting peace in Cameroon, we should end we should put an end to the ongoing conflict in the Northwest and Southwest and organized credible elections where those who will be selected or those who will go to office will be the representatives of the people. We, when you have a president who is not having the mandate of his citizens, he has no, he cares less about their lives and property and that is why we have this conflict ongoing. He's, he has failed in protecting the lives of Cameroonians, he has failed in protecting their properties and he is not willing to even give way for people who have that possibility or who have that ambition to do so. So I think uh, we should not be moving two ways. The, at this point in time, we have one person who is responsible, who is Mr. Bia. My party has given a plethora of solutions. First, end the war in the Northwest and Southwest. Some of these so proposals has even resulted in some of them being arrested and sent to prison. Just to tell you that the government in place, who is short of ideas, is of bad fit. Doesn't want to resolve this conflict. Doesn't want to protect the lives of Cameroonian. Doesn't want to protect their properties. And uh, we will we, we'll keep on, every day we'll keep on coming on this table, give proposals, they will refuse to hear. So the thing now is that we should think among ourselves, what can we do to bring and to bring an end to this peace. And that peace can only be attained by Cameroonians themselves. Cameroonians themselves should be able to take the courage to put down Mr. Bia because to tell him that he should resign. Because he took the mandate, the, the mandate he took in 2018, we thought that we will see and, and we'll be able to live peacefully, we'll be able to see our lives being protected and see our properties being protected. But till at this point in time, Mr. Bia is failing on that. and. Uh, it's not the it's not the role of political parties now. When I look at it, it's not only the political parties that will continue to look at them, thinking that they will be able to put an end to this crisis. No, Cameroonians themselves should come out and cause Mr. Bia to resign because he has failed in respecting the constitution. He has failed in the oath that he took to protect their properties. He has failed to protect the lives of Cameroonians. So Cameroonians have that possibility to put him down and ask him to resign. So the resignation of uh, Mr. Biat, in your own opinion, is the best. help reduce the, the rate of killings? Yes. If he resigns today, maybe another leader will come up and you will be able to listen to what are the possible solutions to resolve the crisis. So there is no, no two other persons is responsible. You are a human rights lawyer. Um, you have been fighting for the rights of those who are illegally incarcerated. Keja said it is not a conflict. It is not a war. It is a conflict. Whether you call it armed conflict or you call it war, I don't want to enter into those terminologies. What we know is that Cameroon is not at peace or Cameroon is not living the peace that it used to live. Why is Cameroon not living the peace that it used to live when Mr. Bia took power in 1982? Cameroon was at peace. So whether you call it armed conflict or war, it, I don't want to enter into those terminologies. What, is, what I know is that Cameroonians are not living as they ought to live. Cameroonians are not living in peace. Okay. So that is a problem. You people should not be crying. People cannot be revendicating for a change. They want to improve or upgrade 
the standards of living and you continue to give a deaf ear. I think that the Anglophones, when the crisis started, the Anglophones were not acting for so much, for too many, too many things. Had it been the government in place, had listened to a people representative when he went to the National Assembly, Kamunyas were asking that we want to live in favorable conditions, convenient conditions, but the regime of the, the, the party of uh, Mr. Keda refused to listen to, to, to Kamunyans and the consequences we are living to them cannot be carried or borne on any other person, can only be borne on them because party. exactly and, <laughs> they, and, they, and they still continue to remain the only person if they want to act in good faith to resolve this crisis. But if they don't want to act in good faith, Kamunyans should take their responsibilities. Good afternoon. I beg to ask the CPDN man where the military protect lives by burning down their properties like burning of the village here and there all over in the north and southwest region. It's come from Martin in Bavusa, Melissa from from Mancon Reeds, right says, greetings, happy Sunday to you, House of Commons. With due respect to Mr. Kidja's opinion, I think he is a true Ambazonian because just like Mr. Paul Latanganji, his word keeps radicalizing the situation in the northwest and southwest, giving room for the war to go on until... Okay. This other one reads, says, uh, the other panelists talked about 20,000 military. Please, come on, don't have... 17,000 military personnel, not to talk of 20,000 military. I think uh, Mr. Atem uh, Ebako um, will react to that. We have 20,000 people fight a whole population, not just um, the non state armed groups. Uh, this other one reads, it says, um, Happy Sunday to you guys in the studio. Great program. Uh, nice to see Mr. Atem Ebako and Barrister Tamfo on the same panel from an anonymous sender. Please, when you write us, tell us where you are writing us from. Uh, Mr. Atemebako, you listen to what um, Pastor Tanfu said, that when Mr. until Mr. Biaz resigns, then we can have a meaningful way to mitigate the violence in the Northwest and Southwest region. But you have the opinion that it is the system, not Mr. Biaz, the colonialist system, that is foiling the war in the Northwest and Southwest region. How do we go out of uh, away from this? Well, I think the, the points and the facts are on ground as realities that we are not dealing here with persons we are dealing here with a system it will not be a surprise that all the cpdm militants do act in the same particular manner they have the same characteristics how do you explain that people coming from different families cultures languages tribes uh, and are all doing the same thing. That simply means that the system is in control and not them are in control. We have to understand this thing. So even if Mr. Bia goes away, he still does not free Cameroonians from the Cameroon which was created by France. So we have to be very careful with the kind of wishes we want. We may let Bia may go and somebody even worse than Bia will enter. So we should be very careful how, if Mr. Bia is going and how he should go. He should go with the system and not that going and leaving the, the system behind. So that is that. You see, one of the things Cameroonian needs to understand is that with the current system we have in Cameroon, the regime does not need anybody's vote or your support for them to be in power. None of us here voted them. Even the Keja who is speaking, the CPM does not need his vote to be in power then that is a simple truth. When you give people the impression that they can go out and decide the future for themselves, when yet you do not even believe that in your own heart, that anybody can win you in any election conducted in Cameroon or in many places that we have seen, giving the people false hope, building in their minds that leadership can be rotational until you set periods and times for elections. When you know none of them even brought you in and no one can take you out that is an abuse of human rights so we have to understand these things that when i spoke of the conflict down there twenty thousand against two thousand i didn't make the analysis that analysis came from the level of the united nations it was when i went up there at the level of the united nations to read statistics on certain issues especially in cameroon I was made to understand that there are 20,000 military that have been deployed in the Northwest and Southwest 
fighting against 2,000 armed separatist fighters. That's international. That is the international figures. figures that were given at the level of the United Nations. You can Google it. Yes, that we have international figures saying that five, uh, 3,000 dead. For example, so the, the, you, you you understand that they have the United Nations is the most is the only accurate body that gives reliable information on things happening around the world that even countries themselves do not know. You go find them at the level of the United Nations Bureau. So it, it is just to tell you that if really we had a government that came from the spirit of Cameroonians, there would not even be a conflict in the first place. Because when you judge this ratio, looking at how much budget the government spends daily to sustain that amount of military, I'm talking of active boys, foot soldiers, holding arms in those two regions, I'm not talking of their officials. If you look at that budget and then you weigh the 2,000 armed separatist fighters that we are talking of, if you take a budget for one day and address those 2,000 boys, you solve that problem. If you use a budget for one day and go to a place like Kwakwa Nakabule that had an inhabitants of 3,000 people and construct homes that were burned back for the people and call them who were in the, in the bushes to come back and leave, that will solve the problem. If you take a budget for one day and call those that have lost their, 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 their source of livelihood in those two regions, and you take that budget and address them, that will solve the problem. Yeah. If you take that same budget that is spent every day and call those whose properties have been destroyed, who have lost their means of, survive, uh, uh, of, of, of surviving, and you use that budget and address them, use the budgets address the lives of those who are being affected Jarvis, this is very important the crisis we are talking here are not animals going through those crises are not goats they are human beings and these human beings are not spirits you can see them how is it becoming a challenge that you take this much money not less than one billion francs that you spend every day in those two regions and yet the people who are going through this struggle are not being affected by this amount of budget that is being spent in these two regions this is just to tell you that there is no good political will on both sides okay where do we go from here mr Ngalim? where do we go from here how do we make this new normal not to become normal again such a way that people sh will not be killed as they have been killed in the northwest and southwest region because whether we like it or not the non-state armed groups too are responsible for some atrocities like Ill, um, adoption kidnapping mayhem both sides um thank you very much i think Boris Campo has given one arm of the answer to that question and uh mr ebako has given the other arm the first arm to that question is President Paul Biya's government has the responsibility and the obligation to end this war. And on the other side, the amount of money that President Paul Biya and his government are using in financing this war is the amount is less, it's almost the same amount of money that Ambazonia, Southern Cameroonians have been asking for, for their local development. If you put these two uh, parameters together, you realize that everything lies in the hands of President Paul Bia and his government. Now, the relationship between the two sides, the government of Cameroon and the Ambazonians, has deteriorated so badly that these two people cannot agree to come and sit down and talk amongst themselves. That is the reason for which, in 2009, the African Commission of Human and People's Rights offered their good offices to host these two parties to sit down and talk. In 2019, uh, in 2018, the Swiss government offered their offices for these people to come and sit down and talk. Some, some Ambazonian groups are already there. Other Ambazonian groups are saying they cannot go there because the government has not yet committed to that peace talk and they want to see everything clear before they go there. So the, the only solution to this problem is sitting down and talking. What happened at the Grand National Dialogue was no dialogue because the main protagonists were not there. And in their absence, you cannot make decisions that will help them. Evident, nothing has changed since the Grand National Dialogue. The war is rather aggravating, is escalating, and methods are changing. What is going to happen tomorrow? 
before the, uh, before the IEDs came in. We do not expect them to come in. Now they are there. What is going to happen? Teachers keep dying. Students keep dying. Students are not going to school. This is going to be the fifth year of no school. It is July. I know by August we will start hearing talks about we have to let children go back to school. A very noble and honorable thing to do, letting children go back to school. We must do that. Children must go back to school. But in what climate, under what conditions will the children go back to school? It is an armed conflict. Bullets are flying left, right, and center. Students are being kidnapped. Teachers are being kidnapped and killed. How will schools resume? There is no way schools can resume. It is therefore mandatory on the government of Cameroon to sit down, agree to talk with the protagonist to this conflict. And they should not do it directly because the relationship between the two is already so bad that the two parties cannot agree among themselves to come and sit down and talk. It is therefore important that they look at, they identify a third party that can sit, that can bring them together. The Swiss have opted. And, and I know that um, the, 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 the Council of the Wise or some of the of uh, main, mainly of, of the former of former presidents of Africa were doing something towards that direction. I, I'm not sure if it is still active or it, or it has died, but that is something that needs to be done. You know, people need to take action to sit down and talk. This language that the CPDM uses that only inflames the situation, only makes people more angry and make makes uh, people to want to take arms is not necessary. My humble appeal to members of the CPDM is be honest to yourselves. Lower the temperature. Lower the temperature. You are representing the government that has the mandate to resolve this conflict. Lower the temperature and hold your party hierarchy. Hold your government to task and oblige them to resolve this conflict. Mr. Kedja, you have lost family members, I am very sure. You have lost a lot in your village. Ambazonians are responsible for some of the chaos. But the government has the mandate, has the obligation, has the responsibility, have to use the taxpayers' money, the money you pay in taxes, to resolve this conflict. That is what should be done, and that is the only way. That is the only way um, peace can return, and justice must also return. Justice here does not necessarily mean that people should be sentenced to prison. Justice here means people should be put where they are supposed to be. They came in in a, it, they came in in 1961 as still the same people and maintain them where they are and peace is going to reign. Respect their right okay. to self-determination. Thank you, Jarvis. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Angalim. Um, let me have brief, briefly you welcome to Innocent. Uh, where do we go from here? How do we make this new normal not become normal again? In such a way that people see uh, celebrating, the people celebrate the death of others. Like you see a military is killed, uh, people celebrate, a non armed armed group is killed, the other camp celebrate. Uh, you see a, a human, a, a civilian is killed, the other camp look for a beautiful name to tag. Is a seller, is a nebula, is a black leg, is a this, that, just to gratify uh, things that are not supposed to be gratifiable. No, we just have to um, invoke or implore. God's wisdom. It's only God that can come and wash Cameroon because Cameroon is living. We are living in a devilish atmosphere that uh, only God, the fear of the Lord, can really make things, people come back to senses. And these are the results or consequences of war because uh, when you live in a society where you see evil to be good, and uh, when you see something good, you don't want to go towards it. You only, only have to implore God and pray so hard that Cameroon uh, at this point in time needs God more than any other thing because uh, we have really done so many bads. Because when you look at Cameroon uh, generally in its history, you are tempted to believe that uh, we are cursed because do you know that the first president of Cameroon is still being out of the country because uh, somebody has refused that he should come back and be lead to rest in Cameroon. So, so all these happenings continue to curse Cameroon the more and we only have to embrace prayers, call for God's mercy before we can really have that society where we have, we can feel for somebody. I should not be happy seeing a military being killed. I should not be happy seeing a separatist being killed and only God can come and touch the hearts of those who are governing Cameroon because uh, if God does not come to intervene, the people seem to have, the, the people have lost their sense of feeling. They have become heartless 
and uh, we should just pray that uh, they be they be touched by God. And if that happens, I think we can come to a normal society. Do you think that these are these these same people are Christians? Eh? Are you saying no. that um, no. they are not? No, they, 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 they should be bad. active. They should be active Christians. But we see them on the with, We with, see them in the church. With God, the with God, there is peace. With God, you know, God will not be happy seeing innocent souls dying. So they should have that Christian the heart. The people leading the revolution from the non-state armed groups, they are pastors. Mm. The people leading from the state armed groups, from the state itself, mm. they are church members, some even build churches and mm. give to. <laughs> so how do you explain the fact that we have Christians in both sides, we have both sides, uh, even the, 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 those who are Muslims, uh, Allah says don't take another man's life, the, the, the God says don't take another man's life, you are talking about God where we have Christian, is something missing somewhere? That is where well, the deception me, is, Jarvis. Me, um, me, <laughs> That's me, where the deception is. <laughs> me, I remain, I'm a Christian, and I believe that uh, until we are visited by God, then can we solve the problems of Cameroon? That's not, that's not going to be possible. <laughs> but it's the until we are visited by God, God will not come down and solve a problem Cameroonians themselves can solve. That's it. God only comes in when human effort is um, limited. That is it. So that is one of the issues that has tied out Cameroon and Africa. They keep relying on God to come and do what they themselves they can do. They can do. Now, talking about <clears throat> the way forward, looking at the both sides, this is a loss to this country mm. and to Africa as a whole. Mm. Looking it from the Pan-African perspective, killing ourselves over a colonial boundary, mm. it is an abuse to the African man. Mm. Like I said it last time, the world, I see it as a neo-colonial agenda, mm. targeting mostly the youth of this country, mm. because both the separatists and the military dying are young Cameroonians. Mm. So this world is a neo-colonial agenda through neo-colonial sponsor leaders to eliminate the youth mm. and keep the African economy stagnant. So, like I will always quote, I have a dream that one day the militaries and the amber fighters, they will meet at war front, drop their weapon, embrace themselves and face the real enemy. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Javis. That's it. <laughs> That, <laughs> that your dream is huge, Mr. Atem Ibako, for coming to Kedia. Um, Munda Kedia, you have you've had your, your normal rank. Okay. <laughs> Let me just briefly Atem Ibako, then you confuse. Uh, Mr. Atem Ibako, you have listened to what Innocent uh, has said that um, it is a new colonial agenda. How do we go from, from where do we go from here to create this new normal, not to become norm, uh, no, uh, normal again? Well, I think what he said is he's spoken out of revelation. And like I've explained that, how do we explain the fact that we are in a country that has a civil conflict where mass population of its population lives in abject poverty, and yet we have the presence of the multinationals in Cameroon. Yet Cameroon does not own its own economy, does not have its own currency, it cannot operate its own, uh, uh, how would I call it, uh, um, uh, projects at a certain level. Cameroon, as a matter of fact, does not have its sovereignty, which is very important for Cameroonians in the future, if ever we are going to build this country in the spirit of our founding fathers. In 1958, 57, 58, where Ingwebe came up with the UPC to fight for the self-determination of the people of this nation. It was not limited to the level of Basa and Bamleke people. This stood for the entire people, whether being English, whether being French. But we realized that was not the vision which came into the 60s. Cameroon must understand that we are dealing here with a deity and a foundation that has been placed in the 60s, which is a curse to the Cameroonians themselves. And whatever we cry out, whatever we bring as change under this canopy will take us nowhere. God is not going to take out for us from this, this, this mess. But God has given us the wisdom to understand what we call ancestral curse and foundational curse which were brought in here by the colonialists. Christianity has instead brought in more damage than we ever imagined. What explains the fact that we have thousands of churches today in Cameroon than ever before? And yet, the crimes that have increased 
have been more than when we did not have the churches. How do you explain those things? How do you explain the fact that a man goes to a house of a native doctor and a native doctor offers you a solution and tells you everything about your life and only asks you for a cock or a bag of salt and that is all because that is what the tradition demands and because he knows he's there to protect the society. But you go to church today, the same prophet tells you the same thing and then converts you into his Christian and then begin to rip out of you. How do you expect a society like this that is poor and at the level of the Christian body is still draws in again and squeezes the communion from the little they have. I'm not against Christ. I'm not against, uh, how would I call it God, but I'm against the white religion that keeps the white man up and then keeps the black man down. Okay. It is very, imp no, no, to, let, let us be frank. We know how Christianity got to Africa. We know the damaging. Do how many of you know that in the 19, uh, uh, 1929, Pope at the Vatican enjoyed slaves. Do you know that it was on the core of Christianity that they sent in missionaries here to come and to come and carry out slaves? Let us be honest that religion, whether it is a Islam, whether it is a Christianity, has not done us any good. Anything that is going to keep us apart must be set okay. aside. Because there's nothing greater than the unity of a people. Because that is what God wants for mankind, for men to come together. And this is not done under a religious body. Thank it you. is done out of goodwill. Um, Katie Amalife, you have listened to the entire panel. Where do we go from here? Mr. Gallen says your party has a lot to, to, to do, that both sides are responsible, but the responsibility to resolve this conflict is on the shoulders of your party. Yes, he's 100% correct. And anybody that says that is 100% co uh, correct, for, for now, President Pobi is the person that has been elected by Cameroonian and legitimately and legally he's the one that has the responsibility to bring peace as the the speaker said that taxpayers have paid their money so anyone blaming the government has his right but the issue that i always want to make it clear is to say for us to have this peace it is collective effort collective effort as the government is doing his own we are doing our own when i earlier said here that uh, we've seen what the government has uh, done and uh, what has the amber at their own part done to bring peace? I didn't say that there is a representative of amber here yeah, because there is no representative of the government here. Yeah. I don't think there is any government worker here, yeah, and there is no spokesman of the government here. Yeah. I'm, I'm representing CPGM and not the government. There are two things different. How that's, do you how, say that's, that's, how, that's why you have Jack Farm Dongo, which is the Secretary General of Communication, and you have of uh, CPTM, and you have uh, uh, Rene Manuel Sadi, the Speaker of Government. How do you it is how very clear. I've just separated communicate. Pardon? How do you separate CPTM from the government? It is uh, where, uh, the party that wins from the government. That does not mean that government is uh, CPTM. That's why we have Isa Chiruma, uh, uh, Jean de Dieu Momo, many of them that they are of different party. Who we say they are CPTM. They are not CPGM. Are the government, and they are always there. So, peace. yes, so what we are saying is that it is something that we need to do together. I will employ those in the diaspora to give uh, peace a chance. As the head of state, President Paul Bia once said in his speech, that it is time for us to forgive and forget and move ahead. All of us, we saw that. If we don't forgive and forget and move ahead, we will still stay at the same place. And in other words, if you don't want me to use that word, I will still use another word. Maybe that will not look Christian. That's why maybe some of you are laughing. We need to compromise. Each part need to compromise. I could have been happy that separate. You say, okay, fine. We don't want separation. This is what we want. That time, I myself, even of the CPTM, I will tell the government that they have compromised you yourself. You need to compromise from this time because that's what we need. So we need to be honest to bring exactly. peace. Mr. Galim, yeah, last one before we go. You don't die. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Briefly, we're um, out of time. Last week. Yeah, my, my last word is my last word is very clear. The CPDM is is the government, and the government is a CPDM, and they have the obligation to stop this war. And uh, they should stop pretending because they know where the Ambazonians are. They know whom the Ambazonians are. They know that Switzerland is ready to bring both sides to the table. They should hook up with Switzerland, talk with Switzerland, and. Uh, this war is going to come to an end. There is no need pretending that that they don't know who whom to talk to, or they they or they think Ambazonians should stop the war. 
the government has international obligations and national obligations to stop this war. And they need to use the taxpayers' money they receive from Kenya and every other citizen to stop this war instead of financing the war and causing the burning of houses and the destruction of okay. human life. Thank you, and it was a pleasure being on the program today. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Uh, Atemi Bako. Before we take leave of you briefly, I'll ask one. Thank you very much, uh, Jarvis. I just wanted to say lastly that uh, in John 10:34, the Bible says, Ye are gods, and the Bible says, He called them gods unto whom the word of God came to, and the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus says, Ye are Christ, and Christ is God. We have to understand that Christ came for the decolonization of the mind. He said, It is a time when nobody will go anymore to Jerusalem nor to this mountain, but the true worshippers will worship God in spirit and in truth. The idea of Christianity has kept Africa down at this position, and we need to redefine those things if we are going to survive. <laughs> of course, Barista Tafu, you listen to the last one before we go. <laughs> to, to hear that he's coming back to, to me that we really need the intervention of God, whether we Christianity are, or whatsoever. So uh, my last word will be to, to see once more call the attention of Mr. Bia that uh, we need to give peace a chance. There is no other person at this point in time that can... Before he wants to leave Cameroon, please let him leave Cameroon. In peace let him do everything possible within his reach as he's still in power to make sure that he resolves the ongoing crisis in the northwest and the southwest and we'll thank him for his long time in office and we'll also thank him for leaving Cameroon in peace as he took it <laughs> briefly a last of all go um the we said the we have always asked for a change in governance and not necessarily a change in government what Cameroonian wants most is the change in governance. It is the refusal of the change in governance that has pushed Cameroonians to ask for the change in government. So why waiting on the change in governance? In government, we keep asking for the change in governance. Thank you. Firstly, I would like to thank the head of state that has sacrificed 39 years of his age serving the nation, Cameroon. <laughs> and other political parties should learn from him and stay away from violence as a politician was rejected visa to go from to go to europe because he's a symbol of violence and he was rejected so all of them should learn from the head of state to bring peace and the last word of the head of state there is violence people are falling it's time for us to forgive forget and move ahead that's what he said and i think that's what all of us should do this program will be rebroadcast today at exactly 10.30 rebroadcast tomorrow at exactly 9 30 p.m 10 30 p.m today 9 30 p.m tomorrow every sunday at exactly 12 to 1 30 we'll have a program house of commons our youtube channel is bt media group youtube channel bt media group uh, you can follow us on twitter my media prime follow us on facebook my media prime on facebook and instagram my media prime and also just to let you know that we are on kanasa channel 309 channel 309 i leave you with this no matter the matter what matter is your matter no matter the matter what matter is your matter and what for matter what should matter for you this day is that the heart of a of a man is desperately wicked says the lord so we must treat each other with love peace unity in such a way that when we meet we shall tell god thank you thank you for watching and goodbye from Cameron's economic capital duala thank you